next plant uh, growth promoter that is cytokinase in today's class we'll be discussing about cytokinase there's a t missing here anyway that is a spelling error cytokinase we'll be discussing about and also we'll be discussing about the hormones abscisic acid and ethylene okay so let us proceed with that in the previous class you know that we have discussed about uh, the two types of hormones that is uh, the auxins and gibberellins so auxins i told you that uh, the naturally occurring auxins they are of the form of indole acetic acid <clears throat> and indole butyric acid synthetic auxins we studied about the naphthalene acetic acid or naaga and 2,4-D, that is 2,4-dichlorophenoxy acetic acid. We had discussed about that. And uh, gibberellins, we had discussed about the uh, foolish seedling disease or bacne disease in paddy plants, which was noticed in Japan. Uh, and that was caused by a fungi, gibberella fugicuri. Okay, so they were able to extract gibberellins from that plant and uh, they studied it. So the, you know, there are nearly 100 varieties of gibberellins or gibberellic acids. So GA1, GA2, GA3, up to 100 varieties of gibberellic acids are there. So we had studied about that and the uh, physiological role of these hormone also we have discussed about. In today's class, we will be discussing about cytokinins. As the name indicates, it brings about cell, uh, cell division. Cytokinesis you have heard, isn't it? So cytokinin hormones brings about the cell division. Even cytokinin is a growth promoter hormone. Okay. So Skoog and co-workers, they observed uh, that from internodal segments of tobacco stems, the callus, the internodal segment of tobacco stems, the callus uh, proliferated only if the nutrient medium was supplemented with extracts of vascular tissues <clears throat> or yeast extract or coconut milk or DNA. So Skoog and co-workers, they observed that uh, when they were doing this tissue culture, plant tissue culture, they had taken the internodal segment of uh, tobacco stems, the callus, the a mass of undifferentiated cells, they proliferated or they multiplied. When we are talking about proliferation, it is nothing but increasing in number. So they underwent cell division or proliferated only if the nutrient medium. See, we are growing this uh, uh, callus in a test tube uh, or in a uh, petri plate. So the test tube here they would be growing that calyx is, is an undifferentiated mass of tissue. They are not differentiated into stem, leaf, or root-like structures. So that is undifferentiated mass of tissue that you can notice in the uh, test tube. So now this undifferentiated mass of tissue, they proliferated or they increased in number only if the nutrient medium, see we provide an artificial nutrient medium, the agar agar and they will be having this macro and micronutrients but apart from this nutrients they also required supplements with extracts of either extracts of vascular tissues yeast extract or the coconut milk or dna so even i remember uh, during my msc we had a uh, we had to take a, a tissue and do the uh, tissue culture. So uh, we took in the apical meristem was taken and it was allowed to grow uh, within this nutrient media in a sterile conditions in the tissue culture lab. Okay, so we were able to get an undifferentiated mass tissue, which we call it as callus. So similarly, uh, when we were preparing this uh, nutrient medium, so the uh, MS Coog medium, we call it as or MS media, culture media. So we had one liter of water, which was being boiled to that. We added the powder of agar agar and mixed it. Before adding this agar agar powder, we had added the nutrients, macronutrients and micronutrients. And even we had it 10 ml of uh, the coconut water. So 10 ml of coconut water, tender coconut water, we used to add that. And then we used to finally add the agar agar and make this semi-solid uh, solution and 
used to pour it in the test tube and allow it to settle down. And to that, we used to inoculate the uh, meristematic tissue so that they could undergo uh, cell divisions. So they formed an undifferentiated mass of callus. If we wanted to have root settings, so we used to change the uh, auxin and cytokinins uh, concentration. Auxin was more in concentration and cytokinin was lesser. If we wanted the uh, shoot settings to take place, the buds to form, so then cytokinin concentration used to be more. So this is how we used to artificially control the nutrients to get the required results. But here, to understand the importance of cytokinins, we are talking about. See, the coconut water, when it was added, it helped in the proliferation of the tissue. The cytocallus is nothing but undifferentiated mass of tissue that is formed during the uh, tissue culture. So you'll be studying about that in uh, the uh, next year, the plant uh, biotechnology, wherein you will be studying about the protoplasm culture or tissue culture, you'll be studying. There will be, uh, we'll be discussing in detail about it. So they could undergo cell division further, the scalars, only when they were able to get uh, the extracts of vascular tissues or yeast extract or coconut milk or DNA. So Skugen, uh, Miller later identified and crystallized the active substance and termed it as kinetin. Okay, cytokinins were discovered as kinetin. For the first time, uh, cytokinins were discovered as kinetin, which is nothing but chemical name is N6 uh, furfuryl aminopurin an adenine derivative. You know the nitrogenous base adenine, isn't it? It's a derivative of that. So they found that the kinetins were uh, furfuryl, aminopurin, an adenine derivative from the autoclaved herring sperm of DNA. So they were kinetins were obtained from this autoclaved. Uh, the autoclave is similar to pressure cooker in the tissue culture labs. So we use it for sterilizing uh, the apparatus so that they are free from microorganisms or spores. So the autoclave, they were obtained from this, kinetin was obtained from this uh, adenine derivative that is furfuryl aminopurin from the autoclaved herring sperm of DNA, they obtained it. Kinetin does not occur naturally in plants. So that is also one of the points that you have to re uh, remember about. So the coconut, the tender coconut water or coconut milk. So it consists of this kinetin pigment. Okay. <clears throat> so kinetin was for the first time extracted from the, it is an adenine derivative, which was extracted from the uh, autoclaved herring sperm. Okay. So sperm DNA, they were able to obtain this kinetin. Chemically, kinetin is nothing but uh, it is N6 furfuryl amino purin. So I have already told you it is a derivative of this nitrogenous base adenine. So zeatin, it was obtained from the kernels of corn, corn kernels, that is zea maize. From maize, it was obtained. So the zeatin, it is named after zea maize. Zeatin from corn kernels and coconut milk, you obtain the zeatin, which is a natural substance with cytokinin-like activities. So zeatin is a natural substance with cytokinin-like activities. So you can remember about it. There are some synthetic compounds with cell division promoting activity. Okay, so natural cytokinins are synthesized in the region of rapid cell division, that is root apices, shoot buds, young fruits. So there you find this natural cytokinins are synthesized in uh, these regions. And these natural cytokinins, they were obtained from the kernel of uh, corn kernels and coconut milk. So they are natural substances with cytokinin-like activities, so zeatin. So I've also uh, informed you about kinetin, which was obtained from the autoclaved uh, herring sperm DNA. So kinetin is a derivative of adenine, nitrogenous base adenine, which is 6-furfuryl, so IP-furfuryl aminopurin it is. So you can remember about this. 
uh, kinetin zeatin is obtained from the kernel of corn corn kernel and the coconut water they have extracted this coconut milk they have extracted this uh, zeatin so they are all natural substance with cytokinin like activity so natural cytokinins they are synthesized in the growing tips of the plants like the root and shoot apices uh, the meristematic zones of root and shoot apices as well as the in the young fruit you can find uh, the natural cytokinins they are synthesized in this region which induces which is undergoing rapid cell division now the physiological functions of cytokinins so the functions are they play a role in cytokinesis the cell division cell elongation and cell differentiation is brought about by this cytokinins <clears throat> cytokinins have an important role in this uh, cell division initiating the cell division they help to produce new leaves new chloroplasts in leaves lateral shoot growth and adventitious shoot formation so they are also going to help in the uh, production of new leaves chloroplasts in the leaves lateral shoot growth and adventitious shoot formation is helped by this cytokinins <clears throat> the cytokinins the cytokinins also help to overcome the apical dominance so you know that whenever auxins are present they undergo apical dominance so the apical buds are dominant and they develop to form so the lateral buds are usually suppressed whenever the apical uh, buds are present so but if you remove the apical bud so the lateral buds or auxiliary buds they start developing so that we have noticed it so apical uh, bud dominance is due to the presence of auxins Uh, distribution in the apical bud and uh, which makes this lateral buds or axillary buds inactive but when you spray these plants with cytokinins the lateral buds becomes active so they uh, cytokinins help to produce new leaves chloroplast in leaves lateral shoot growth and adventitious shoot formation so this is promoted by this cytokinins so there is also a richmond lang effect wherein uh, the leaves of this uh, primrose plant so xanthium probably the leaves of this primrose plant the xanthium plant so they were detached from the uh, mother plant and they were tied on a thread and these leaves were continuously sprayed were sprayed with cytokinins and they were fresh for nearly 20 days okay that is the effect of cytokinins they help to produce new leaves chloroplast in leaves they also help in the production of lateral shoot growth and adventitious uh, shoot formation so this richmond lang effect so wherein the leaves were kept continuously fresh for 20 days by spraying them with cytokinins so their chloroplast production helped in the leaves being uh, fresh for nearly 20 days even though they were detached from the mother plant okay those things they have not discussed here but in state syllabus we used to discuss these uh, points of it okay so the uh, cytokinins also help to overcome the apical dominance cytokinins they promote nutrient mobilization which helps in the delay of leaf senescence so cytokinins they promote nutrient mobilization which helps in delay of leaf senescence that is aging up of leaves that is the reason that uh, you could, the leaves were kept uh, for 20 days they were kept fresh by uh, spraying them with this cytokinins so this richmond lang effect so you should understand about so they why it was able to keep them fresh is cytokinins helps in Uh, synthesis of chlorophyll in the leaf they also promote nutrient mobilization which helps in the delay of aging up of leaves okay that is what are the uh, properties of cytokinins so major properties they initiate the cell division so cytokinins also brings they also have an important role uh, in the opening of stomata okay the closing of stomata is brought about by abscisic acid so the opening of stomata is initiated by this cytokinins 
ethylene is the C2H4, the formula. It is the uh, only ripening gaseous hormone. The only gaseous hormone is ethylene. It brings about the ripening of fruits. So Cousins, it is the name of the scientist, he confirmed the release of a volatile substance from ripened oranges that hasten the ripening of stored bananas. Okay, so there is a volatile uh, substance released by the ripening uh, oranges, which hasten the ripening of uh, stored bananas. Later, the substance was identified as ethylene. So they identified it later as ethylene. So ethylene is a simple gaseous plant growth regulator. It's a growth inhibitor to be very specific. So ethylene is the gaseous uh, ripening hormone. The only gaseous hormone is ethylene. It brings about the ripening of fruit. So it was noticed by Cousins, uh, the name of the scientist, okay, who informed that whenever the orange, ripening orange was kept along with uh, the bananas, the, this hastened the ripening of stored bananas. Later, the substance which was released was identified as ethylene the volatile substance released was identified as ethylene ethylene is a simple gaseous plant growth regulator it is synthesized in large amounts by tissues ethylene is generally synthesized in large amounts by tissues which are undergoing senescence and ripen and uh, ripening of fruits senescence is aging up so tissues which are undergoing aging up they synthesize large amount of ethylene as well as the ripening fruits also uh, liberate ethylene so the functions of ethylene are <clears throat> it influences the horizontal growth of seedlings so it influences the ethylene influences the horizontal growth of seedlings so swelling of axis and apical hook formation in dicot seedlings. So it influences the horizontal growth of seedlings. Uh, then it is also going to help in the swelling of axis and apical hook formation in dicot seedlings. So that is what is the role of ethylene in dicot seedlings. It promotes senescence. Senescence means aging up and abscission of plant organs, especially of leaves and flowers. If you look here, this is a uh, aged up leaf. They are starting to, they have already yellowed up. So they have to get detached from the mother plant. That happens because of the formation of this abscission layer. So the ethylene gas, it promotes senescence. One is aging up and formation of abscission layer in plant organs, especially the uh, leaves and flowers. So because of which they are shed. So the abscission layer results in shedding up of leaves and flowers. Okay. So the ethylene gas, it promotes senescence that is aging up and also formation of abscission layer in plant organs, especially in case of leaves and flowers they do that. So the ethylene is also a hormone which promotes fruit ripening. It enhances the respiration rate during the fruit ripening. This is called respiratory climatic. So you should understand about this respiratory climatic. They might ask you for one marks. Okay, the ethylene gas, it promotes fruit ripening. It enhances the respiration rate during fruit ripening. So it enhances the respiration rate or it multiplies or increases the respiration rate during the ripening of fruit. So this uh, increasing the rate of respiration during ripening of fruit, we call it as respiratory climatic. So since it is the climax process, uh, the ripening part of it. So this increase in respiration during the ripening of fruits, uh, which is brought about by ethylene, we call it as respiratory climatic okay so the ethylene also breaks the seed dormancy and bud dormancy that is they help in the uh, germination of seed and development of buds so the ethylene is going to break the seed dormancy and bud dormancy they initiate germination in peanut seeds peanut is nothing but groundnut in America, they call it as peanut, isn't it? So the ethylene gas initiates the germination in 
peanut seeds or groundnut seeds and sprouting of potato tubers. So it helps in the sprouting of potato tubers. So it breaks the seed and bud dormancy, initiates the germination in peanut seeds and sprouting of potato tubers can be brought about by this ethylene gas. So these are the physiological functions of ethylene gas. One another thing I wanted to bring to your notice is there were, there were traditions in some of the tribes uh, of uh, South American tribes, I think, probably wherein when they were growing this pineapple uh, plantation, so they were having a bonfire as a ritual. So in that crop part of it, they used to have a bonfire as a ritual. So they found that this bonfire helped in uh, the synchronization of the flowering or initial synchronization of flowering in case of this pineapple. What we are consuming in pineapple is inflorescence. So synchronized flowering happened because of exposure to ethylene gas. So during the uh, beginning of the uh, 18th century or 19th century, the street lamps in uh, England, they were all uh, lighted by this ethylene gas. So sometimes they notice that whenever this ethylene gas leaked, the leaves of the surrounding leaves, the uh, leaves of the surrounding trees, they were all shed. So they notice that uh, the, when the trees are exposed to this uh, ethylene gas, they result in the shedding of leaves. Okay, so they resulted in senescence and formation of abscission layer. So these are all some of the properties that they studied using this ethylene. So when they had a bonfire in uh, uh, like crop of pineapple amidst this when they had a bonfire, it released the ethylene gas that was led to synchronized flowering in case of this pineapple tree, pineapple plants rather. See the most widely used source of ethylene is ethyphone. Okay, so ethyphone is the most widely used source of ethylene. So ethyphone, so you have to take the phone. Ethyphone, you can remember it as. Okay. Uh, so this probably ethyphone is, if I recollect it properly, the chemical part of it is 2-chloroethylphosphonic acid. I used to remember it as CEPA, C-E-P-A, 2-chloroethyl phosphonic acid. I'll just type it. Ethyphone, the chemical nature is 2-chloroethyl phosphonic acid. So you can, in short, remember it as CEPA. So maybe in the uh, NEAT examination or in CET, they might ask this question. So 2-chloroethyl phosphonic acid or CEPA is the uh, scientific name of ethyphone. Ethyphone, you can remember it that way. Commercially available uh, ethylene is in the form of ethyphone. Ethyphone is nothing but 2-chloroethyl phosphonic acid. So ethyphone is an in an aqueous solution is readily absorbed and transported within the plant and uh, they release the ethylene shortly. So ethyphone, you, when you dissolve it in water and this aqueous solution is sprayed on the plants, they are readily absorbed and transported within the plant and it immediately releases and it releases ethylene slowly. So ethyphone, they hasten fruit ripening. Here you can notice the ripening of tomato is brought about by this ethyphone. Ethyphone hastens the fruit ripening in tomatoes and apples. And they also accelerate abscission in flowering. Okay, they also accelerate abscission in flowering and fruits. So the thinning of uh, so ethyphone, it initiates the ripening in tomatoes and apples and it accelerates abscission in flowers and fruits. So if you want to harvest fruits from trees, uh, you can expose them to the ethyphone and that leads to the shedding up of fruits also. So the thinning of cotton, cherry, walnut is also noticed by this 
ethiphone. So it promotes, ethiphone promotes female flowers in cucumbers, thereby increasing the yield of plants. So when you spray ethiphone on a uh, cucumber plant, so they are going to promote more formation of female flowers. And the more the number of female flowers are there, the more it can undergo fertilization and the yield would increase in the field. So that is how they are very helpful for the farmers in increasing the uh, harvest of cucumbers because they promote female flowers in cucumber plant whenever they are uh, sprayed with ethiphone. Ethiphone is 2-chloroethylphosphonic acid. That is its chemical nature of it. So commercially available or uh, the synthetic uh, ethylene that is available is in the form of ethiphone. So they accelerate the ripening of fruits as well as it accelerates the abscission in flowers and fruits. So thinning of cotton, cherry, walnut, it takes place by this ethiphone. The next hormone that we'll discuss about is abscisic acid or ABA, ABBA, you can remember it as. So abscisic acid, ABA. So you can see in this slide, a tree which does not have any leaves at all. A tree, a tree which is completely stripped of flowers and leaves in the winter season. And here you find these leaves of this oak plant, isn't it? So the leaves of this oak plant, they are all shed. So during mid 1960s, it was reported three kinds of inhibitor. That is inhibitor B, abscissin 2 and dormin. So three types of inhibitor, IAD, you can remember it as inhibitor B, abscissin 2 and dormin. So there were three types of inhibitors. That is what they reported during 1960s. So they were chemically identical and now they are known as abscisic acid. So inhibitor B, abscissin 2 and dormin. So they were the initially noticed uh, inhibitors, growth inhibitors. But chemically, they are similar, identical, and now they are known as abscisic acid. Inhibitor B, uh, then the abscissin 2 and dormin. Now they are all known as, chemically, they are known as abscisic acid or ABA. ABA is the derivative of carotenoids. You know the carotenoid pigments, isn't it? They are the derivative of carotenoids. Okay, it regulates abscission and dormancy. Abscisic acid regulates or controls abscission, that is shedding up of leaves and dormancy. The dormancy of seeds and buds, they are all regulated by the abscisic acid. So which is a growth uh, inhibitor. So it regulates abscission and dormancy. Let us understand the function of abscisic acid. So the it acts as an inhibitor of plant growth and metabolism. It prevents plant growth and metabolism from taking place. It is inhibits seed germination. Abscisic acid prevents seed germination. So abscisic acid stimulates closure of stomata in the epidermis, whereas the opening of stomata is promoted by cytokinins, even though they have not given that point, you should make a point of note of that. Cytokinins promotes opening of stoma and abscisic acid, they are going to stimulate the closure of stomata in the epidermis. So the abscisic acid increases the tolerance of plants to various stresses. So various kind of stress that they can undergo like water stress and other things. Therefore, the abscisic is also called as, abscisic acid is also called as stress hormone. They might ask you for one mark or in NEAT or CET, which is the stress hormone. So the stress hormone is abscisic acid. So abscisic acid is also called as uh, stress hormone. They help to overcome different kinds of stress. So they increase the tolerance of plants to various kinds of stress. That is the reason abscisic acid is also called as the stress hormone. So abscisic acid has an important role in seed development, maturation, and dormancy. Seed dormancy by ABA helps to withstand desiccation. See, seed dormancy is promoted by abscisic acid. So whereas ethylene gas, they break the seed dormancy. So the seed dormancy 
is promoted by this ABA, which helps to withstand desiccation, that is drying up and other factors which are unfavorable for growth. So it has an important role in seed development, abscessic acid, see not only seed development, but maturation and dormancy. So seed dormancy is initiated by abscessic acid. It helps to withstand desiccation and other factors unfavorable for growth. Now we have to understand what is the interaction of this plant growth hormones. Okay, so plant growth regulators, they play individualistic or synergistic role. Such roles may be complementary or antagonistic, that is against the existing uh, requirement. Antagonistic means opposite to the requirement. So plant growth regulators, they can individually play and help in the individually, they can help in the development of plant or they can function together with other hormones, that is synergistic role. So plant re growth regulators plays individualistic or synergistic role. Such roles may be complementary. It might be complementary or it can be opposing roles. Like one of the hormones promotes dormancy, another of them, it breaks dormancy. So their antagonistic roles might also be there. So plant growth regulators interact to affect dormancy in seeds or buds. They interact to affect dormancy in seeds or buds. So abscission, flowering, senescence, vernalization, apical dominance, seed germination, plant movements, etc. So plant growth regulators, they interact to affect uh, various aspects of a plant like uh, dormancy in seeds or buds, abscission formation in plants. All these are affected by the plant growth regulator interaction. So flowering, senescence, vernalization, apical dominance, seed germination, plant movements, all these are affected by the interaction of plant growth regulators. So in most cases, abscisic acid acts as an antagonist to gibberellic acid. They are exact opposite in function to that of gibberellic acids or gibberellins. So in most of the cases, abscisic acid, they act as antagonist to the uh, gibberellic acid, to the functions of gibberellic acids. So what are the factors which influence the action of plant growth regulators? They are two types of factors, intrinsic factors, which is, as I've already told you, it is because of the genetic makeup. Extrinsic factor, it is because of the external factors. So the extrinsic or environmental factors are light and temperature. Intrinsic factor, as I've already told you, it is uh, the genetic makeup. Like a plant might be a, a dwarf plant, and that is genetic makeup. So the growth hormone there uh, the growth regulators will be synthesized in, the growth promoters are synthesized in lesser amount because of the genetic uh, nature of it. Okay, in a tall plant, uh, if the genomic, genomic factor is for tall plant, they would be promoting more synthesis of growth promoter hormone. As a result, they grow tall. So these are intrinsic factors. Extrinsic factors are because of uh, the extra environmental factors like light and temperature. So next, let us understand the role of light and temperature on flowering. So we have this photoperiodism and vernalization. So the role of light and temperature on flowering, we'll understand about it. So the photoperiodism, <clears throat> it is the response of plants to uh, the duration of day or night that they are exposed to. It is a response of plants to periods of day or night that they are exposed to. So accordingly, uh, there are plants which flower only when they are exposed to longer duration of light. We call them as long day plants. And there are plants which flowers only when they are exposed to shorter duration of light. So we call them as short day plants. And there are plants which flower irrespective of whatever the duration of light that they are exposed to. So we call them as day neutral plants. 
So the photoperiodism is the response of plants to the periods of day or night, that is duration of day or night. So that is the response of plants to periods. Some plants require light to induce flowering. So light is required for certain plants to induce flowering based on the light duration that the plants should be exposed to uh, induce flowering. We call it, uh, they are pre accordingly plants are of three groups, long day plants, they require the exposure to the light for a period exceeding a well-defined critical duration. So they require light uh, more than the critical duration period. They require the exposure to light for a period or duration exceeding a well-defined critical duration. They require a light for a period exceeding the well-defined critical duration. Short day plants, they require the exposure to light of a, for a period less than the critical duration before the flowering is initiated in them, okay? Then we have this day neutral plants. They have no correlation between exposure to light duration and induction of flowering. So the flowering is independent of exposure to the duration of light. So there is no, they have no correlation between exposure to light duration and induction of flowering. So we call it as day, day neutral plants. So in long day plants, they should be, uh, flowering is induced only if these plants are exposed to, uh, exposed to light periods, which exceeds the critical uh, duration of light. So critical duration of light, if they exceed, only then they undergo flowering. If that uh, long day plants, they don't get that exposure exceeding the critical duration of light, then there is no flowering in such plants. So we call them as long day plants. Similarly, short day plants, they undergo flowering only when they are exposed to uh, light uh, periods, which is lesser than the critical duration. Only then they undergo flowering. If they are exposed to light above the critical duration, they do not undergo any flowering. So we call such plants as short day plants. Okay, day neutral plants, they have no correlation between exposure to light duration and induction of flowering. There is no correlation. So photoperiodism is a phenomenon in which uh, the plants flower whenever they are exposed to uh, light. So light exposure or dura exposure to duration of light induces flowering in case of photoperiodism. So photoperiodism, it is a response of plants to duration of day or night or periods of day or night. Some plants require light to induce flowering. Photoperiodic plants, they require light to induce flowering except for the day neutral plants. So here in this slide, you can notice that short light, long darkness. So they have eight hours of sunlight and 16 hours is dark. So this induces plants to flower, okay? Short light is eight hours sunlight, short dark period is there, which is of eight hours duration. Eight hours, very low light intensity they get. So here the plant remains vegetative. They do not undergo uh, flowering. So short light is there. That is eight hours of uh, sunlight. Long dark period is there, which is 16 hours. Uh, and this long dark period is interrupted with a flash of light. So this is the flowering in a short day plant is suppressed by very low intensity of light and also by a single flash of light during the long dark period. So the short day plants, they require a short duration of light like eight hours sunlight and 16 hours of darkness. Even if there is a flash of light in the 16 hours of darkness that leads to uh, the plants not flowering and they remain vegetative. Whereas uh, they are exposed to short duration of light for eight hours and they are exposed to eight hours of low intensity of light and eight hours of darkness. The plants remain, the plant remains vegetative. They do not undergo flowering. In case of this, uh, 
third experiment where they have a exposure to eight hours of sunlight and 16 hours of darkness, which is only interrupted by a flash. A flash of light is interrupted during the 16 hours. Uh, so then their plant remains vegetative. They do not undergo flowering. So they require equally very short duration of sunlight and 16 hours of uninterrupted darkness. Okay, so this is what this light indicates for a short day plants. While shoot apices modify into flowering apices, they cannot perceive photo periods. So while shoot apices, they are modifying into flowering apices, they cannot perceive photo periods. That is, they cannot recognize the duration of light. The site of perception of light or dark duration is the leaves. So the where is the uh, site of perception of light, it is the site of perception of light or dark duration is the leaves. It has been hypothesized. There is an hypothesis that has been put, put forth that there is hormone for flowering. So there is an hormone which is required for flowering. When plants get enough photo period, the hormone migrates from leaves to shoot apices to induce flowering. So this is the hypothesis. So they have hypothesized that there is a hormone for flowering. So whenever the plants get enough photo period, the hormone migrates from the leaves to the shoot apices to induce flowering. This is what they talk about, the photoperiodism, which is induced by hormones which are secreted in leaves. So this is an hypothesis. Now, the second part of role of light and temperature on flowering, we'll discuss on the temperature on flowering. So we'll discuss about this vernalization. What is vernalization? It is the phenomenon in which some plant depends quantitatively or qualitatively on exposure to low temperature for flowering. So it is a phenomenon in which some plants, they depend quantitatively or qualitatively uh, low on uh, quantitatively or qualitatively on exposure to low temperature for flowering. So the quantitative or qualitative exposure to low temperature is required for flowering. So that is what we have to understand about the flowering in case of uh, these plants, okay? So vernalization is, it is an effect when plants, uh, whenever they are exposed quantitatively or qualitatively to low temperatures, so they start flowering. So vernalization is a phenomenon in which some plants depend quantitatively or qualitatively on exposure to low temperatures for flowering. The advantages of vernalization are, so it prevents precocious reproductive development late in the growing season. It enables the plants to have sufficient time to reach maturity. So the vernalization prevents early reproductive development late in the growing season. So it prevents precocious reproductive development late in the growing season. So it prevents the flowering later in the growing season because they require quantitative or qualitative exposure to low temperature. So vernalization prevents early or the precocious reproductive development late in the growing season. So vernalization also enables the plant to have sufficient time to reach or attain maturity. Okay, so the examples for vernalization, some food plants like wheat, barley, rye. So wheat, barley and rye. So they have two varieties, the spring varieties. These are normally planted in the spring and come to flower. Similarly, our uh, paddy plants also, the samba variety of, uh, they have seasons for this kurve season, samba season. They have this rice growing at these seasons. Okay, so some food plants like wheat, barley, and rye, they have two varieties, the spring variety. These are normally planted in the spring and come to flower and produce grain before the end of the growing season, okay? Then there is the winter variety. If they are planted in spring, it would normally fail to flower or produce mature grains within a span of a flowering season. 
hence they are planted in autumn so the winter variety of wheat is always planted in autumn they germinate and over winter come out as small seedlings uh, resume growth in the spring and are harvested usually around mid summer so winter varieties they cannot be planted in spring if they are planted they normally fail to produce flower or produce mature grain within a span of uh, flowering season hence they are planted in autumn so the winter variety of wheat barley and rye they are planted in autumn season so they germinate and over winter they come out as a small seedling they resume their growth in the spring and are harvested usually around mid summer so the vernalization in biennial plants biennials are monocarpic plants that is uh, monocarpic is they flower only once in their lifetime so biennials are monocarpic plants that normally flower and die in the second season okay so two years plants they are so the first year they have the vegetative growth second year they have this reproductive phase so vernalization biennials are monocarpic plants that normally flower and die in the second season example beetroot sugar beet or beetroot uh, cabbages then carrots they are all example for this biennial plants so subjecting the growing of biennial plant to a cold treatment stimulates a subsequent photoperiodic flowering response so whenever you are going to subject them to cold treatment so it stimulates the plant to undergo flowering so it stimulates a subsequent photoperiodic flowering response see in this biennial plant the first year they would be uh, the in a vegetative stage second year they would enter into the reproductive phase so the first year when they are in vegetative stage they have this uh, roseate arrangement of leaves because of short internodal distance in the second year there is an increase in this internodal distance and as a result of it it leads to bolting so bolting and flowering so we had discussed that in uh, gibberellins gibberellins can induce bolting and flowering in vernalization uh, vernalized plants or here uh, if these uh biennial plants they are exposed to lower temperatures so it induces them to undergo subsequent photoperiodic flowering response so that is about our discussion on this uh, plant growth regulators and we have discussed about two concepts one is photoperiodism another is vernalization so we have discussed on these two concepts for today's class and that completes our discussion on the plant growth regulators plant growth regulators the plant growth and development we have completed a discussion on it okay now do you have any doubts or clarification dear students you can just let me know so i'll clarify your doubts